Well, welcome back, folks. Another exciting JLAM bio video here for you today. Today in physics class, we're working on video 4-2. We are going to be applying Newton's laws and friction today. So we took a look at Newton's three major laws last time. Well, now what we're going to look at is how can we apply these laws to diagramming forces um, and applying concepts of friction. So hopefully by the end of this video, you should be able to connect Newton's laws and coordinate systems to determine forces in the x and y direction. Very similar to what we did with velocities, acceleration, vectors, all that good stuff. You should also be able to draw free body diagrams. Differentiate between weight and mass. Use and apply Hooke's law to springs and explain and calculate forces due to friction. So it seems like we're covering a lot of stuff, but uh, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. So when solving Newton's laws problems, we'll just talk about this to begin with, uh, it's really important that we draw what's called a free body diagram. Now, a free body diagram, you need to consider all of the forces that are at play here. And you draw all those forces using a coordinate system to determine the forces that are applied to the x and y axis. Again, we, we set it up very similar to a vector problem, which means that we need to make sure that we consider triangles, consider the Pythagorean theorem, sine, cosine, tangent, etc. So for example, if we look at the diagram here, we've got quite a few different forces at play. There's a force of the child um, due to gravity, which is what the arrow pointing down is. We have a normal force, which is pushing back up on the child. You have a force going the uh, to the left here, and that's the force that the kid is having in the tug of war here. And then you also have a force going in the X and Y direction of the teenager here, who is pulling not only to the right, but also pulling up as well. So we would do some Pythagorean theorem in order to determine the force of that particular uh, red arrow in the x direction and the y direction to be able to determine the net forces that are at play as a result of the tug of war. So again, it works very similar to how we did vectors with velocities. We're just going to focus on them with forces this time around. So let's consider this, uh, exp let's consider this situation. Two astronauts are using jetpacks to push a 940 kilogram satellite toward a space station. If astronaut one pushes 46 newtons in the positive x direction, and astronaut two pushes 46 newtons in the positive y direction, what is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration? So the question here is asking about acceleration. When we're given forces, well, we need to remember a couple things. First off, that force equals mass times acceleration, right? F equals ma, really important concept here. So we know the mass. The mass here is 940 kilograms. Now we can figure out the force and then be able to determine the acceleration. So let's think about this for a second. We've got one astronaut pushing 46 newtons in the positive x direction. So here you've got 46 newtons. And you got one pushing this way, 46 newtons. Okay. So those are the only forces being applied here. This is the only force being applied in the y direction. This is the only one being applied in the x direction. So we can figure out the f uh, acceleration in the x and y direction. And then as a result of that, we can then use a little bit of Pythagorean theorem in order to figure out the direction that the, or the magnitude and direction of the acceleration. So in order to do that, we need to put in F equals MA. So we need to do it for both directions. So force of X equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction, and the force in the y direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Well, in order to get acceleration by itself, we need to divide by m on both sides. So the acceleration in the x direction is going to equal 46 newtons divided by the mass. And same thing in the y direction. With both of these, we're going to get the same answer, 0 0.049 meters per second squared. And 0 0.049 meters per second squared. And again, this is in the x direction, this is in the y direction. So if we kind of set this up, we have 0.49 here and 0.49 here, and I want to know that. Well. Again, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for that. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So c is equal square root 0 0.049 squared plus 
0, 4, 9 squared. Plug those numbers into our calculator and solve. We get a net acceleration of 0 0.069 meters per second squared. So that's the magnitude of the acceleration. But what about the direction? Well, now that we know all of the different aspects of this triangle that we've got here, I can now plug in anything in order to get that angle. So if I take the inverse tangent, I can just use 0 0.49, or I'm sorry, 0 0.049. Probably should have written it right the first time, right? <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to get is an angle that is 45 degrees. And that makes sense because you're pushing with the same amount of force in the x and y direction, so you would expect it to split the difference between 0 and 90 and move at a 45 degree angle. But again, that's just how you go through and do some of these free body diagram problems. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's move on. So we've talked a lot about gravity already, and we know that gravity is a force that pushes downward on an object towards Earth. We're feeling gravity as we sit in our chairs listening to Mr. Lamb talk about physics. Uh, but an equal and opposite force is known as the normal force, which pushes back up. That explains why there's no net acceleration of me continually going through the Earth. <laughs> there's a force that is equal to the force of gravity that is pushing back up on a particular object. So this results in our net force of an object at rest to be zero. You know, a book or laptop sitting on something, um, there's the, obviously the force of gravity that is always continuously pressing on that object. Well, there has to be an equal and opposite force pushing back up, or otherwise the laptop is just going to continue to move, or the book's just going to continue to move through the table um, and downwards towards the center of the Earth. This force is known as the normal force, which pushes back up perpendicular to the surface. So uh, a couple of the things I want you to keep in mind is that weight and mass are actually not the same thing. They're very similar, but they are not. Weight is a function of mass and gravity. So weight in newtons equals mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Mass simply refers to the amount of matter something has. So an example on the right here, so somebody with a mass of 63.5 kilograms or about 140 pounds uh, would have a weight of 623 newtons on Earth. But if you're on different planets, you have to keep in mind that different planets based on the size and density have different accelerations due to gravity. The moon has about a third less, I'm sorry, a sixth less gravity than Earth does, and that's why the individual weighs only about 23 pounds on the moon. That's why when you see pictures of people on the moon, they're able to bounce around here and there. Jupiter has a much, much larger gravity due to it being, well, much, much larger. <laughs> and so a 140-pound person on Earth would weigh 355 pounds on Jupiter and would weigh 3,914 pounds on the Sun. Not to mention the fact that if you were standing on the Sun, you would be instantly vaporized due to the incredibly warm temperature of the Sun. Some other concepts that we can look at, including stretched or compressed strings and how they exert forces. So the force N um, of this is directly related to the spring constant and the change in M the force being equal to the spring constant times the change in length. Now, the spring constant is directly related to the stiffness of the spring itself. Another concept to think about is over here on the right-hand side, and if we're in an object that is moving up or down, how that impacts the acceleration due to gravity. If the acceleration is zero in an elevator, for example, um, then you have a normal weight. If we're going up the elevator, then we need to add the acceleration of the elevator moving up to the acceleration due to gravity. So that would actually make you have greater than normal weight. If we're going down, we need to subtract it from the acceleration due to gravity. And if the acceleration going down is equal to that of gravity, then you are in zero Gs, my friend. You have negated the uh, acceleration due to gravity and you're just kind of free floating there based on, the, um, based on just being in the elevator itself. A string with a spring constant of 21 Newton per meter is stretched to 3.4 centimeters what is the force required to cause this amount of stretch? Well, let's see what we can come up with here. Let's look at our formula for Hooke's Law, which is what we looked at previously, and that is that the force is equal to the spring constant times the change in length. Um, the only diff thing we need to focus really on here, because this is a pretty straightforward problem, um, is that this needs to be in meters. So we need to convert that 100 centimeters in a meter at point zero three four. 
we'll plug that into our calculator and solve. And the force is 0.71 newtons. Right, so again, very easy to just plug in and solve and we're on our way. Let's focus a little bit on friction. Now friction is the opposite force that opposes motion. You know that if you slide an object on a surface, it doesn't just slide infinitely. Uh, different surfaces have different what we call coefficients of friction, um, and as a result, the object comes to a stop either quickly or slowly. So if you were to you know push a ball on carpet, um, it's going to slow down much faster than it would if you were to push a ball on hardwood floor or on ice. That is because the coefficient of friction is different for carpet, is much stronger in carpet than it would be in hardwood or ice. Kinetic friction is the friction experienced when two surfaces slide against each other. So um, that's kind of what we're talking about is when the ball is rolling, eventually it slows down. It just slows down faster on a surface with a higher coefficient of friction. Now this friction force in newtons is determined by the normal force, n, uh, times the coefficient of kinetic friction. Now when we talk about the normal force, remember that the normal force is the opposite of the acceleration due to gravity. So we'll use 9.8 meters per second squared um, to look at the normal force when we plug it into our equation. Someone at the other end of the table asked you to pass the salt. You slide a salt shaker with a mass of 50 grams with an acceleration of 0.787 meters per second. What is the coefficient of friction between the shaker and the table? So we've got a couple formulas we need to keep in mind here. Remember that the force um, is going to be equal to coefficient of friction times the normal force. So let's go ahead and rearrange that. Um, let's divide by n on both sides. So we get force over normal force equals your coefficient of friction. We'll also remember that F equals MA, right? So we can then use some of this information in the formula to be able to solve. So if we've got uh, F equals MA, so we have MA over acceleration due to gravity equals the coefficient k. Remember that the normal force is also the mass and acceleration, but that's due to gravity, right? So we have mass and acceleration over mass and 9.81 meters per second equal your coefficient of k. Well, the mass of the object is the same, so that's going to cancel. So basically, I'm just going to take the acceleration of the object divided by 9.81, and that gives me my coefficient of friction. And I plug in and solve. So again, it's taking that F equals MA, it's applying that in a bunch of different situations. We're not really given the force here, but if we look, we're given mass and acceleration. So I could go ahead and plug that in and solve. Now, you would not technically have to do it this way where you cancel it out. You would just recognize that you have mass twice on there and cancel it, but you can always plug it in and solve as well. So static friction is actually very similar to that of kinetic friction. The problem is, is that static friction is the force that opposes the sliding of a non-moving surface past one another. So you know how like when you're about ready to slide something, like let's say a big piece of furniture, um, and it takes some energy to really get it to move, but once it starts moving, it's actually easier to move. Well, that's because you're overcoming the static friction. This is the friction that must be overcome in order to move an object across the surface. And again, it's given by the same formula as previously. We're just looking at the static force versus the kinetic force. Now, different surfaces have different coefficients of friction, just like what we talked about previously. But typically, the static coefficient of friction is greater than that of the kinetic coefficient of friction, simply because the object is non-moving. So it's going to require more force to get it to move rather than to keep an object moving. Let's move on. Students, sets, students set up an experiment to determine the coefficient of static friction between a 1.8 kilogram pumpkin and a desk. The procedure showed that adding 11 newtons of sand to a pail caused the pumpkin to slide. What is the static coefficient of friction? So same concept here. And again, we're solving for the static coefficient of friction, so we're going to use the same kind of formula that we used last time. Okay. Well, um, we know, gosh, that's an awful looking mu. Well, 
we've given the force of the object. It took 11 newtons to make that happen. Um, and now down here, we just look at the force due to uh, the normal force. Okay. And now we just plug in and solve, just like we did before. And the static coefficient of friction is 0.61. So again, just utilizing F equals MA in order to be able to solve for a variety of different problems. Uh, again, like I said, pretty straightforward stuff today. Hopefully you're able to connect Newton's laws um, using uh, free body diagrams, differentiate between weight and mass, use and apply Hooke's law, and calculate forces that are due to friction. Always remember that F equals MA. Thanks a lot, guys. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.